Well, good morning, Meadowview. After a nice blink of the power, I think we are back and ready to worship. So would you stand with us as we sing to the one who's gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy that loves us. It's a glorious day when he called us from the grave. Let's sing this morning. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive, all my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name. saved us, now your mercy has saved my soul, now your freedom is all that I know, the old made new, Jesus when I met you, you called my name. rescue when it was our May Day. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broke. seated this morning. Well, hey, good morning. All right, good to see all of you here today. It's a fun day in the house of the Lord. We're here to worship, and we're to worship Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? Amen. All right, well, just a couple of announcements there. Our cards laying around that say May Day on them. If uh, you wanted more information about how to serve in any of these areas, kids, missions, 
Connect Security Students. All you gotta do is scan that and uh, look there for more information. There's also on the missions table another scan code that is if you would like to be involved with disaster relief. You can get put on the, the roster there to uh, serve or to do the trainings. So uh, that's another way. And then this Wednesday night, we are uh, kind of moving in towards our summer schedule. So uh, we know how May is, and May uh, gets a little crazy, and people uh, run off to the beach and do all kinds of things next month. So uh, we'll be in and out. But uh, May schedule looks a little bit different. So kids and youth, I think, are having their uh, end of the school year parties going on. And right here in the sanctuary, uh, I'm inviting adults to come in here because we're going to have a missionary here to share uh, what he's going to be doing. And this, this guy, I've known him since he was a teenager, and uh, he's, he's grown up now. He's way taller than I am, and, and uh, he's learned Spanish, and he's off to the Dominican. And so he's going to be here to share what he's going to be doing down there. And I told him that if he would come here, that we would be a church that lays hands on him and sends him out as a missionary. So we are all about the kingdom and the, and the kingdom-mindedness of, of individuals who have heard the call on their life to go and to share the good news. And so we want to support them uh, financially, but more importantly with prayer. And so uh, be here. John Simmons is his name, and uh, it should be a good night here in, in the sanctuary on Wednesday night. So I, I invite you to be a part of that. And this morning is a special kind of teary morning for some adults uh, because our little babies are graduating. And so um, that, that's, that's happened, and so we're going to have a graduate recognition here in just a little bit, um, and you're going to get to hear about uh, what they're doing, where they're going, and uh, how we can support them. So let me pray, and we'll jump back into worship. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that uh, you're alive, God, that the grave is empty that you have defeated death, you've defeated sin, and you've placed your Holy Spirit within us. It is your righteousness. It is nothing of our own. And so, God, we lift up your name. We lift up praises to you because you are worthy of all honor and glory and power. And so, Lord, we thank you for this morning. We ask, God, that you would capture our hearts, you would fill us with your spirit, and, God, that we would be drawn towards you, that we would fix our eyes upon you. You are the greatest. And, God, let all the other things of this world just looks so pale and dim in comparison. Father, we love you. In Christ's name, amen. All creatures of our God and King, let's praise him this morning. His blood and 
rejoice in his great love. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on him. Oh, praise him. to reign heaven and earth will join to say oh praise him alleluia then who shall fall on bended knee oh creatures of our God and King oh praise
And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth the bold shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood. and praise this morning. Amen. What a wonderful song to sing this morning. Praise God. So this morning, uh, for those of you that don't know, my name is Jonathan. I work with our students here at Meadowview. I've been here for almost two years now. And this morning, uh, we have the privilege, or I have the privilege, of honoring our graduates. And uh, what a privilege it is to be able to honor and show rec recognition to those that are due. And so this morning, I get the privilege of doing that. But on this Serve Sunday, um, I pray that you all feel called to serve. But then I also pray that you all, after this morning, feel called to disciple. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, is the need for us to disciple. But Grad Sunday, this time of year is busy for all of us. <laughs> I'm busy, you're busy, everybody's busy, but this year is also, or this time of year is also a time to celebrate endings and new beginnings. Time to celebrate endings and new beginnings. And so we have the opportunity, and I choose the word opportunity here, I, I chose it intentionally. Because a lot of times I feel like we can often just disengage from this part of our service and not engage and show due honor and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And it truly is an honor for all of us to recognize our graduates and show them the honor that they are due. And so this morning, I wanna encourage you with two things. It's an opportunity for us to do two things. As Romans 1 or 12, 10 says, it's an opportunity for us to love one another with brotherly love and affection, outdoing one another and showing honor. And this morning, as we recognize our graduates, let's outdo one another in showing our graduates honor. And number two, this morning is an opportunity for us to rejoice with those who were rejoicing as Romans 12, 15 tells us, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and then the, the flip side is to warn or to weep with those who are weeping. And so this morning in our service is a time of rejoicing with those who are rejoicing, because graduates, are you rejoicing? You're done. Yeah, I was, I was rejoicing, I was done. <laughs> so you are rejoicing, and so we as a church wanna rejoice with you. And so church, don't disengage during these next few minutes. Let's show honor and let's rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And so graduates, those of you that have been in contact with me, I'm gonna call your name. And as I call your name, if you'll just kind of come and line up along the front of the stage, uh, we have a gift that we wanna give to you, but then also at the very end church, we're gonna show them how proud of them we are. And so if you will stand up here uh, when I call your name and just wait. So uh, without further ado, let's, keep, let's go through our graduates. And the first one is Claire Tart. Claire Tart is the daughter of Jeremy and Jenny Richards. She is graduating from Walker Valley High School this year with honors. She was a member of the Walker Valley Beta Club, the uh, Walker Valley Marching Band, the World Language Club, the Spirit Stangs Club, and she plans on attending Chattanooga State in the fall to earn her nursing degree and then transferring to UTC to work on a degree in athletic training. Shelby Sarton. Shelby is the daughter of Brian and Jennifer Sarton. Shelby is graduating from James Madison Online this year, completing high school a whole year early, a whole year early. Shelby plans to attend Tennessee Wesleyan University in Athens, where she plans to enroll in the nursing program there. 
Dylan Richards. Dylan's not able to be with us this morning, but we do want to honor him. And so Dylan is the son. Yeah, let's give Dylan a round of applause. Dylan is the son of Jeremy and Jenny Richards, and he is graduating from Trinity High School this year. He plans on joining the Navy after graduation. While in high school, Dylan was on multiple sport or was a multiple sport athlete playing both football and basketball, and he also participated in the FCA and Drama Club. Colby Adams. Colby is the son of Willie and Vicki Adams. Colby is graduating from Chattanooga Central High School this year where he was involved in a multitude of clubs and programs, and you can see everything that Colby is honored for on the screen. Colby plans to attend Chattanooga State to major in history in the fall. Ashley Johnson. Ashley is the daughter of Mike and Deanna Johnson. She is graduating from James Madison Online this year, also a whole year early, so let's show her honor for that. That is very impressive, both Shelby and Ashley. And she plans to go to nursing school and continue her education in the fall. Emma Boring. Emma is the daughter of James and Kristen Boring. Emma is graduating from Walker Valley High School this year where she was a member of the Key Club, made the honor roll multiple times, and she plans to attend community college in the fall and then transfer to a four-year school to get her degree in nursing. She plans on being a labor and delivery nurse. Carson Ramsey. Carson is the son of Ronald and Stephanie Ramsey. He is graduating this year from high school and he plans to attend the Tennessee College of Applied Technologies where he plans to study electromechanical instrumentation technology. Talk about a mouthful. <laughs> electromechanical instrumentation technology. Michaela Mason. Michaela is the daughter of Landy, Landon and Katie Mason. She is graduating from Silverdale Baptist Academy this year where she was on the honor roll all four years and was a part of the cheerleading team. Michaela is planning on attending UTC in the fall where she will major in nursing. <laughs> a pandemic will do that to you, <laughs> show you the need for nurses. Eli Duncan. Eli is the son of Jeff and Abby Duncan. He is graduating from Walker Valley High School this year where he was a member of the Beta Club, the Oceanography Club, the Educators Rising Club, and he had a gold GPA. Eli is planning to continue his education at Cleveland State this fall, where, in the words of his mom, he will eventually become something awesome. <laughs> Mary Grace Little. Mary Grace is the daughter of Michael and Brandy Little. Mary Grace is graduating from high school this year, where she was a member of the Beta Club, the National Honor Society, and Mary Grace is planning to attend Chattanooga State in the fall to continue her education. Olivia Tubbs. Olivia is the daughter of Joey and Julia Tubbs. She is graduating from Udawal High School this year, and she plans to attend Chattanooga State Community College in the fall to continue her education. Brandon Greenhall. Brandon is graduating from Chattanooga State Community College this year with his associate's degree. Brandon plans on continuing his education at the University of North Georgia in Dahlonega, Georgia to double major in history and English to hopefully one day become a teacher. Mitchell Thomas. Mitchell is graduating from UTC this year with a degree in electrical engineering, and he plans to enter the workforce after graduation. Hannah McGrath. Hannah is graduating magma cum laude this year with her bachelor's degree in nursing from Carson Newman. She plans on working as a nurse at UT Medical Center in Knoxville, working in the Ann Partum unit. And finally, Ethan Wright. Ethan is graduating summa cum laude from Lee University with a degree in communications. He plans on working freelance in the film industry and hopes to one day produce his own feature film. Church, these are our graduates for 2021 this morning. Let's show honor to them and let them know how proud we are of all of them for completing this massive, massive accomplishment. Well, graduates, I do have one charge for you this morning, and I have one charge for you, graduates, and it's this. It's fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so as you walk into new beginnings and leave behind your years in high school, you've been given the book, Don't Waste Your Life. And I hope that you will read it and that you will eat it up and that you will not waste your life. Live your life for the glory of the Lord and fear him. So I'm gonna pray for our graduates church this morning and I would encourage you to where you're at, maybe you lift out a hand and pray for them as well and let's send them out into their new beginnings as they finish and rejoice <laughs> over their endings. 
So let's pray. Well, Lord God, we thank you for our graduates. We lift them before you, God, and we thank you so much for those that we love and for the work that you're going to continue to do in their lives. God, they're a gift to us and to many others, and so thank you for allowing them to be a part of our lives. During this season of new beginnings, God, we ask that you would make their path clear. We ask, God, that you would keep them grounded in your word and that you would help them to remember constantly how you have been faithful to them always and help them to remain fixated on the beauty of the gospel. We ask, God, that you would give them wisdom and clear direction over their lives, that you would give them understanding beyond their years. Thank you for all that you're going to do for your kingdom through these students, Lord. We pray that you would direct their steps, that you would have plans for them that would prosper them, and that every place that you have determined for them to walk would be paved clear. We ask for you to open doors that need to be opened and closed, every one that should be shut tight. We pray and ask that you would equip them to do the work of your ministry in every area that they might work, electricians, nurses, historians. God, we ask that you would be glorified in and through their lives. Bless them, Lord, and their families. Amen. Well, let's show honor one final time to our graduates as they make their way back to their seats. You guys are free to go back and sit in your seats unless you just wanna stand up here the rest of the morning, you're free to do that as well. <laughs> but church, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Joshua chapter two, or not Joshua, I'm sorry, Judges chapter two. Judges chapter two, Just, Judges is right after the book of Joshua. That was a test for you. So Judges is right after the book of Joshua, turn in there. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew in front of you. And uh, if uh, you wanna take that, that's our gift to you. Or they make great graduation gifts. So take one of those and give them to a graduate this morning, maybe on your way out, it'd be great to give that to them as well. But I want you to know church, as we get started in Judges chapter two, that we have been blessed. We have been so blessed as a church in many, many ways, but in one way particular that I wanna highlight this morning. Pastor Jeff's already shown this slide this morning, but I wanna show it to you again because we have been given a large number of young people. We've been given a large number of young people at our church. On the slide, you'll be able to see that 33% of our church is under the age of 18 and that 9% of our church is under the age of 19 to 24. That means 42% of our church is under the age of 24. Praise God, that is incredible <laughs> that we at Metaview have a lot of young people. To say that we've been blessed with young people is an understatement. God has, for whatever reason, his divine plans given to the people of Metaview, a church in the middle of nowhere, a multitude of young people. But church, I wanna quote Uncle Ben, from Spider-Man, <laughs> because I think it's appropriate. With great power comes great responsibility. And with great privilege comes great responsibility, church. We have a great privilege of having young people here. And with that privilege, there's responsibility that we have to take up. For us, we need to understand that we are privileged, but that also means responsibility comes in tow with that. I was talking with another pastor in his church and uh, here locally about 20 miles away from us or so. And he was talking about the gap that he has in his church between the ages of 18 to 55. In his church, he has kids that are younger than 18 and as soon as they graduate high school, they leave. And they don't come back until they're 55. Now, how does he know that? He's not been there for 55 years, but there's a gap. There's a gap between the ages of 18 to 55. The pastor that I was talking to was highlighting a larger problem that's affecting not just his church, and his church is in the city. Not just his church, but all churches. In a, a study according, or in a study done by Lifeway Research, 69% of students surveyed said that they were attending at age 17. 69%, that's awesome, at age 17. 58% of the students surveyed said that by the age of 18, they were not attending. Or 58% said that they were attending at age 18. You see the drop, 10%, not coming anymore. 40% said that they were attending at age 19. Do the math, that means 60% are not attending at age 19. This is according to Lifeway. 
And once they reach their 20s, that number drops down to 33% said that they were attending, meaning 77% were not. There is a consistent dip every year that a student gets older in their attendance of church, and not just attendance. I want you to hear my heart. I'm not just saying we wanna get students here, but their participation in the body of the church. This is a problem that we face as a, as a church, as a whole. We face the gap. Where do these kids go when, do they, when they leave? Why do they leave? And we're not gonna get into the reasons of why they might leave and why they might not leave and, and all that. But the gap is preventable to some degree. We can avoid some of the gap, and I mean some because we don't ever wanna prevent a college student from going to college to further their graduation and them not being here, meaning they're not a part. We don't wanna do that. (laughs) And just because college students might not be here does not mean they're not plugged into a church somewhere else. And we wanna rejoice over the fact that those college students have found somewhere to plug in. And it might not be here and that's sad, but at the same time, we're rejoicing over the fact that they are plugged into a local body somewhere. The gap is preventable. In order to prevent the gap from occurring here, we have to change the way that we think about ministry to students, to the next generation. We have to stop thinking about ministry as just getting kids here, doing whatever it takes to get them here, and then pushing them off into their own areas and letting the professionals do the ministry or those that feel called to next generation ministry doing the ministry. We can't think about it that way anymore because what's happened as we've been thinking about this, as we've done it it that way, is this trend continues. After high school, they leave. It's not working. Events-based ministry does not work long-term. Rather than people being called to do next generation ministry, I wanna suggest to you that this morning that all of us in this room, all of us are called to do next generation ministry. Every single person in the room from the youngest to the oldest So again, I wanna show you this slide again, because maybe you're saying, well, it's really not that important for us here, because here at Metaview, we don't have a gap. So I wanna show you this slide again, this time with those numbers highlighted that I've already talked about. 33% of our church is under the age of 18. 9% between the ages of 19 and 24. Where do they go? We're blessed, but at the same time, there is a gap. And for those of you that have been at Meadowview for a long time, just look at the faces of the student ministry. Look at the faces of the kids ministry and the college ministry. Some of those kids that you poured into in the kids ministry are not here anymore. And praise God, maybe they're somewhere else plugged in, but maybe they're not. So again, I'm not saying let's just gather them all up and keep them here, we don't want you to ever go anywhere. But I'm saying we have been given a privilege and we need to be responsible for shepherding the next generation. So how do we keep students plugged into the church from kindergarten throughout the rest of of their lives? And it's by all of us actively participating in the ministry of the next generation. And so I wanna be clear, what I'm calling us to this morning is discipling the next generation discipling the next generation. What do I mean by discipling? Maybe you don't know what that word means. Well, Mark Dever defines discipling as this in his book, Discipling. Discipling is a relationship in which you teach, correct, model, and love someone else. Discipling is a relationship in which you teach, correct, model, and love someone else. So be clear, what I'm saying this morning is that each of us in this room have a call to disciple the next generation, to teach, correct, model, and love the next generation. Now, one thing I think it's important for us to say before we get into Judges chapter two is I am by not any means suggesting this morning that through our relationships with students, that through our relationships with students, we can deepen and grow that student's relationship with Jesus. I'm not saying that we do anything to change the heart of a student. I fully know and fully believe that God is the only one who can change hearts and that Jesus is the only one who can cause him or cause these students to love him more. So by no means this morning, when we talk about discipling, am I saying that you are the one that does the work? 
What I am saying is that you have to put yourself in a position to be willing to teach, correct, model, and love to these students. We'll talk about why. But before we even get started in Judges 2, I wanna pray for our next generation because I think that it would be um, inappropriate (laughs) for us to not understand that God does the work in the hearts of students. And if we want students to stay plugged in, then it's gonna take a work of God in their hearts. And so I ask that you would also take this time as I pray and pray for our next generation ministry from kids, elementary school, preschool, middle school, high school, college, all the way through. So let's go before the Lord and pray for our next generation this morning. Well, Lord God, we come to you this morning and We cry out on behalf of our next generation here at Meadowview. And not just the next generation here at Meadowview, Lord, but the next generation across the church. God, we pray that you would change their hearts. God, we pray that you would bring those that have not professed salvation, God, that you would bring them to salvation. God, for those that are walking in blatant disobedience to you, I pray, God, that you would bring them back to obedience. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the privilege that we have to disciple the next generation here at Meadowview. We pray that you would change the hearts of our students. God, be with us this morning as we read your word. In your son's name I pray, amen. So finally, that now brings us to Judges chapter two. (laughs) Judges chapter two, verses seven through 10 is what we're gonna be looking. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. Starting in verse seven, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had all seen the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance at Timnath Ares in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. At this point in Judges chapter two, for those of you that have been reading chronologically through the Bible with us as a church this year, we know that what's happening is Joshua is transitioning out and the judges, the time of the judges is transitioning in. The time there's a transition of leadership. But then verse 10 says that those who were not of Joshua's generation did not remember and did not know the Lord. How is this even possible? (laughs) How is this even possible? Because one generation ago, the people of Joshua's generation were going through the promised land, conquering the land, and have now inhabited the land. So they saw God's faithfulness in all of that. But then not only that, two generations ago, the people of Israel were led out of Egypt by God (laughs) through a pillar of fire by night and through a cloud in the day. These people should know that God was faithful to them So then how is it that two generations later, there's a whole generation that's faithless, that does not remember the works of God, that does not remember anything that the Lord had done for Israel? Because just two generations ago, they were being led out of Egypt. So what happens? The first thing that I want you to see this morning is that the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. This comes from verse seven. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. (laughs) And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had all seen the great works that the Lord had done for Israel. The people of Israel and the generation of Joshua were faithful to the Lord. They were faithful to the Lord. Yes, they sinned. Yes, they were disobedient. But all the while, Joshua was pointing his people back to the Lord, saying, remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. And so prior to being the leader of the people of Israel, we see in Exodus 24, if you have your Bibles, turn back there. It's a couple books back. Exodus 24, verses 12 through 13, we see that Joshua was the assistant to Moses. In Exodus 24, 12 through 13, what's happening here is Moses is about to go up onto the mountain to receive the law, to receive the 10 commandments. And we have this in verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up onto the mountain of God. 
At this point, the Lord is inviting Moses to come up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, to receive the law for the people. And when we think of the story, we don't often think that Joshua was with Moses. We kind of just run through it really quick, but Joshua was with Moses on the mountain. And we know that Joshua stayed with Moses on the mountain the entire time, because if you flip over in your Bibles, just a couple chapters to Exodus 32, Exodus 32 verse 17 says, when Joshua heard the noise for the people or of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. So what's happening here is after Moses has received the 10 commandments, they hear a cry coming from the camp of the Israelites. And we know that what's occurring is that there's a golden calf being offered worship, right? Remember this, Moses threw the tablets down, broke the tablets, goes back down into the village, corrects the people. But Joshua, we see in 32, that Joshua was still there because he thinks that the sound is a war, not worship, false praise. So Moses, we see throughout Exodus 24 to Exodus 32, Joshua is not mentioned again. So it, it seems like Joshua is not there to really do anything, but he's just there to observe what's going on. He's there to watch Moses, to watch this interaction. He's not mentioned. So Moses, it seems, is investing in Joshua. He's inviting him into his life to partake in everything that he's doing. So let's go back a little bit further. Go to Exodus chapter 17, because this is where we first see Joshua. This is where we first see Joshua. In Exodus 17, nine through 11, we see Joshua for the first time. It says in verse nine, Moses said to Joshua, select some men for us and go and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the hilltop with my God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him and fought against Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill, while Moses held his hand up, Israel prevailed. But whenever he put his hand down, Amalek prevailed. This is the first time we see Joshua. The first time we see Joshua, Joshua is empowered by Moses to go and have battle, right? And when we read through the entirety of this chapter, chapter 17, this account of the battle of the Amalekites, or the Amalekites, we see that it's not really Joshua's military ability, it's God who has fought the battle for the people of Israel. But at this point in Joshua's life, he's probably around 20 years old. So Moses has just handed an entire military of people for an entire country and said, go fight the battle. Moses is investing in Joshua from the very beginning of their recorded relationship. Nothing said about Joshua again until Exodus 24. And at that point, Joshua is Moses's assistant. So Joshua see, or Moses sees the need for Joshua to be developed, discipled invested in. From both of these passages, Exodus 17, Exodus 24, we can see that Moses was investing in Joshua because he was inviting him in. Hey, come do this, come do this. And then empowering him to lead. Hey, go do that, go do that. So how does all of this then relate to Judges 2, 7? Well, at the end of Moses' life, he's unable to enter the promised land. Do you remember this? He's unable to enter into the promised land. So let's go to that account in Numbers chapter 27. So flip over in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 27. We're gonna look at verses 15 through 19. Because at this part of Moses' seeing of the promised land, he's voicing his concern to God, saying, well, who's gonna lead the people? So let's pick up in Numbers 27, 15. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, Appoint a man over the congregation who shall go out before them and shall come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be a sheep that have no shepherd. And then in verse 18, so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom the spirit is laid, or in whom is the spirit and lay your hand on him. The next leader of the people of Israel was along beside Moses the entire time. He was there the entire time, allowing Moses to pour into him. For 40 years, they wandered in the desert, and Joshua was there with Moses, observing everything that he did. So Moses transitions his leadership to Joshua, and Joshua has been prepared to lead by following the pattern of Moses. So when the time comes for Joshua to lead, he's ready. He's seen, oh, this is how Moses did this. This is how Moses did that. And it's not that he's mimicking Moses. It's that he's seen a pattern of, oh, here's what I could do in this situation. Or here's how Moses would handle this, which then ultimately is how would the Lord handle this? 
Church, we're all like Moses in this way. I'm not saying we're Moses, but we're all like Moses in this way. Right now, we're leading the church, those of you that are not in the next generation. Right now, we're leading the church, but we, like Moses, are finite. There comes a point at which we will all pass away. And at that moment, we cannot lead the church anymore. We can't lead the church when we're not here. There's gonna come a time in your life when you're leading in the church, when you don't wanna lead in the church anymore. You're done. We're like Moses in this way. We will eventually not be here. And so as I was thinking about this transition from Moses to Joshua, I think about a relay race. In a relay, in a relay race, what's happening is these two runners, or four runners, however many, they're running around in the circle, right? They're running, they're racing, they're racing. But then at one point, there comes a transition, the moment where they hand the baton off to signal you're the runner to the next runner, all right? And I'm not gonna demonstrate this for you because I, I have too much pride to run in front of you and try and demonstrate a, a proper baton, a baton handoff. And I, frankly, I just don't know how to do it. But what happens is, is the moment of transition both runners, the runner who has the baton and the runner who is about to receive the baton are running at full speed. They're running at full speed and the runner who has the baton is holding the baton back, getting ready for that next runner to pick up the baton and continue to go. And so there's a point at which both of these runners are running at the same speed. And this is what is happening with Moses and Joshua. Moses is running full force, baton in hand. And he's holding it back to Joshua saying, okay, now it's your turn to lead. Watch me, watch me. And Joshua is running up beside Moses to pick up the baton and continue running. You see that transitional moment though, that transitional moment from me having the baton to handing it off to the next person, that moment takes practice. It takes preparation. It's the most important part of the race because if you drop the baton, you've got to stop. <laughs> You gotta start over, you gotta pick up the baton, you gotta go. And so this moment of transition takes time, takes practice. And church, our practice and our preparation for handing off the baton of leadership to the next generation is discipling, teaching, correcting, modeling, and loving. So that when it, the time comes for them to fight moral revolutions and sexual revolutions, they've been prepared not just by the institution of the church here, but by the church body, you, all throughout their lives to go and, to, and fight these battles. I was, I was reading this study a little while ago that, that spoke about how students, in order to stay plugged into the church, need five meaningful relationships with adults outside of their parents. Five meaningful relationships with adults to stay plugged into the church all the way through college. And they're not saying that, that adults are the reason that these students stay plugged in, but what they're saying is, is that if they have a reason to feel that they're loved and they know that they're loved and there's adults there, not just students that love them, they're gonna be here. And church, I'm a product of this. I'm a product of these five relationships. It doesn't have to be five. If it's three, if it's four, it's great, but they're saying five. But I'm a product of this directly. Came from a great family but the church recognized that I needed to stay plugged into the church. And so there were five men, and I'm gonna name drop them now because I wanna honor them. <laughs> Jake Simcoe, Jonathan Kyle, Todd Colbert, Alan Wattenbarger, Scott Black, and many others who stepped up to the plate and said, we're gonna run with you. We're gonna disciple you, teach you, correct you, model to you, and love you so that when the time comes for you to lead, you've seen us do it. So church, who are you investing in? Who are you pouring into, church? Do you even know the names of our students or our kids? Do you have a meaningful relationship with any of our students or kids? I'm not condemning you. <laughs> I'm just saying, church, we need to be about the next generation and we need to have meaningful relationships with students, not just courting them off to their own part of the building, but saying, come in, let me tell you about my life and how God was faithful to me. The biblical pattern of discipleship is that we invest in someone and then we raise them up 
to be leaders on their own. This pattern holds through throughout all of scripture. Jesus and the disciples who eventually became apostles who built the early church. Biblical discipleship. Paul invested in Timothy, who eventually became the leader of a congregation. So the biblical pattern of discipleship is to find someone to invest our lives in and then give them opportunities to lead so that when the time comes for them to lead, they're capable and they're not fearful and scared and don't know what to do. Are you doing that? Are you discipling anyone? So then what happened? The transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua was a great one. Joshua does a lot of good things in the land, but then the transition from Joshua to the judges is not a good one. So what happens? We see this in verses eight through 10. The people fell away. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance at Timnath, Ares, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all the generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Joshua died. There's a transition but there's no one there. Joshua died, there's a transition, no one's there. No one's there to take up the mantle of leadership. Nowhere in scripture does it talk about Joshua having an assistant like Moses had an assistant in Joshua. I'm not saying that he didn't, I'm just saying it's not in scripture that he did. So what happened that a whole generation fell away? How does a whole generation fell away? Because we understand we're two generations away from the Exodus, which is roughly 40 to 60 years, right? So what happens? Well, it says directly in verse 10, the people essentially forgot the Lord and the work that he'd done for them. The people did not know the work of the Lord and the work that the Lord had done for them because they were not taught about the work that the Lord had done for them and the people of Israel. You see, Moses made sure that while Joshua, Joshua was discipled, Joshua knew that these people needed to remember So we invested in Joshua. But in the transition from Joshua to the judges, Joshua's not ensured that there's somebody there to make sure that they remember. Moses made sure they remembered. And while Joshua was a great leader, he didn't invest in anyone to make sure that the people would remember. So church, do you wanna have a legacy that lasts long beyond your life? Invest in your children And not only your children, but the lives of someone else's children, who then they will then go and invest in the lives of somebody else's children and somebody else's children and somebody else's children. And soon enough, you're 60 years old and you have great, great grandchildren in the faith. Invest in the life of a student to ensure that they don't forget who God is so that they can invest in the life of someone else, so on and so on and so on. Discipling is a sure way to ensure that you have a lasting legacy for the kingdom of God. And so I have a question. Whose fault is it if a child comes home from kindergarten thinking that two plus two equals five or that the sky is green? Whose fault is it? It's the teacher's, right? The teacher's fault. They don't know any better. This is the first day of kindergarten. I don't even know if they teach that in kindergarten. But if they do, it's the teacher's fault because the kid was not corrected. Whose fault is it that there was a faithless generation that rose up after Joshua? Whose fault is it? Joshua's generation. Joshua's generation's fault that they did not teach the people to remember the faithfulness of the Lord. So then church, whose fault is it if we have a large percentage of students walking away from the faith because they don't know God or they've forgotten God, it's our fault. It's our fault. It should break our hearts to know that there are students that have walked away from the faith and never to return and we could have done more. And it started, it starts in kindergarten, not when they're a senior in high school. Moses invested in Joshua, but nowhere is it seen that Joshua invested in anyone. So when the time came for there to be a good relay race baton handoff, Joshua's running full force and he looks back to, hold the, or to hand the baton off and there's no one there. <laughs> or maybe someone's there, but they're just running far, way farther behind Joshua, not at the same speed. 
They botched the transition. Church, we don't need to botch the transition. (laughs) The problem of the faithless generation starts when Joshua's generation does not feel the need to teach them about the faithfulness of God. The problem of the faithless generation could have been solved by having someone there after Joshua to help the people remember the faithfulness of the Lord. A lot of us in this room would probably be able to think back to somebody in our lives that we would credit who we are as a person to, and spiritually as well. Maybe you have that one person that you think of, oh, well, this person invested in me, slowed down, talked to me, helped me know how to read God's word on my own. So maybe you have that person in mind, but then who are you investing in? Because see, the problem was, is yeah, great transition from Moses to Joshua, excuse me, But then from Joshua to the judges, they were like, hey, it's great that we were invested in. It's really good that somebody invested in us, but we're not gonna do it for somebody else. (laughs) It's our turn. (laughs) It's our turn to step up, church, and disciple the next generation. The problem of drop-off when students graduate is because we're not involved in the lives of students, church as a whole. We've courted them off to their own areas. We've said, you go here, you do the people that are called to you, and then we're gonna be in here doing our thing. Church, next generation ministry is for all of us. (laughs) Because all of us have been called by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations, including our own. And so church, we need to stop raising our kids to be converts to Christianity who have the right answers to the questions of who God is and what Jesus has done. And instead, we need to start making disciples of our kids who will go and make disciples, who will go and make disciples, who will go and make disciples. Stop making converts. Start making disciples. So then what do we do with all this? What do we do in light of everything that we've read in Judges 2, 7 through 10? Well, for one, we're all called. We're all given the command to go to make disciples. And so to say that you're exempt because you've done that, maybe you did that for 20 or 30 years, and now it's somebody else's turn. Well, that's great. But it's also still your turn to still be investing in somebody. So I wanna show you this graphic as we finish up. I'll show you this graphic. It says there's 168 hours in a week, in a given week, seven days, 168 hours. That means there's 8,736 hours in a year, meaning that there's 157,248 hours in a life from zero to age 18. It's a lot of hours. It's really not that much when you stop and think about it, but it's a lot of time. If you spend an average of three hours a week at church, that's only 2,808 hours a week at church, meaning Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, That's 1.79% of an adolescent's life. If we think about ministry to the next generation in terms of inside these walls, we only have 1.8% of their life to minister to them. Church, we gotta get busy. (laughs) That's what that shows. There's not enough time. (laughs) We gotta do it now. We gotta do it yesterday. (laughs) But then I wanna wanna pose to you this. This is the next graphic. Again, 157,248 hours, roughly 78,000 hours spent sleeping, roughly 78,000 hours spent awake. Do the math, it's 50%. Took me a little while to do that math. And really this number could be bigger because a lot of our kids aren't sleeping 12 hours a night. Eight, 10, six, five, four, three, Maybe they're not sleeping. (laughs) But church, if we think about next generation ministry as ministry that we can just invite students into our everyday lives, then we can reach them for half of their life. If we stop thinking about ministry to students outside of just only these walls, then we have the possibility of reaching these students for half of their adolescent life. And by this, I mean, hey, you know what? I'm planting a garden today. Will you come help me? Let me tell you about this. Let me teach correct model and love to you. Or hey, I'm gonna go running today. 
You wanna go with me? All the while, teaching, correcting, modeling, and loving to students. Hey, I'm gonna go eat waffles. You wanna come with me? Let's bond over waffles. And all the while, teaching, correcting, modeling, and loving. I said it in the video if you were in here for May Day, but students really, they care what you say. They do. But before they'll even listen to what you have to say, they have to understand that you care for them. Genuinely care for them. Not that they're a project, but that you genuinely care for them. And so church, what I'm calling us to this morning is to take full advantage of their entire lives and say, okay, ministry outside of the church. I go running, I'm gonna invite somebody to go with me. I garden, I'm gonna invite somebody to do it with me. Meaningful relationships with students will help us prevent the gap from growing in our church. Church, we've been blessed with much. I think we'd be being bad stewards if we would not change the way that we think about next generation ministry and stop thinking about it in terms of professionals do this or the people that are paid to do it, do it. And instead we start thinking about all of us have the responsibility to make sure that when it's time for us to transition out, there's somebody running behind us that we're ready to hand the baton off to. So church, for the sake of our students, of all ages, all of our students, elementary schoolers, middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, for the sake of the kingdom of God, let's be a church who makes disciples. Let's contribute to stopping the gap from growing by each of us committing to teach the next generation about Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done. Let's commit to correcting wrong ideas and thoughts about who Jesus is and what he's done. Church, let's commit to model to our students what a life lived for the glory of God looks like. And church, let's commit to genuinely loving our students. What a perfect morning for you to apply discipling. We have a bunch of graduates. How about you start a meaningful relationship with a student today? by going up and letting them know how proud you are of them. Introduce yourself. I promise they won't bite. Some of them might, but that's a good time for you to correct. (laughs) But church, we're all called to next generation ministry. We're all called to disciple the next generation to ensure that they don't fall away, that they don't forget. So I pray that you would go and be empowered this morning to disciple the next generation. Let's pray. Well, Lord God, I thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have, the privilege that we have here at Metaview to have a multitude of students. God, may we not waste it by just saying, well, that's, that's a job for somebody else. But God, may we all be motivated to make disciples who makes disciples who makes disciples who makes disciples all for the glory of you, not to build some legacy for ourselves, Lord, but to, to build your kingdom. God, may we all care about the lives of students because the students are the future of the church. And God, if we don't invest in them now, then when will we do it? We're not guaranteed tomorrow, Lord. So Lord, today, may we start building relationships with students that are lasting a lifetime and teach them, correct them, model for them the love, what it means to live for you and love them genuinely. God, make us a church that cares deeply for the next generation. In your son's name I pray, amen. Will you stand, will you respond this morning? As we seek to be intentional, let's sing a song of intentionality. I've decided to follow Jesus. I have decided 
to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me. Behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. And though none go with me, still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Let's go and be intentional disciples as we leave this building, this place. Thank you for being in worship with us this morning.